So guys, we'll begin in five minutes, five to six minutes. Also, please turn on your cameras because I need to see if you guys understood what I said or what it's like. So keep your cameras on. Yeah. If you are watching from YouTube, there's going to be a lag. Like I have already said it in the Zoom class, it will take like uh, 15 seconds for the same thing to be said on YouTube. I hope you guys can see the blank screen. Okay. Guys, we will start in five minutes. But if you have any questions about neuroanatomy or whatever, just you can ask me now. So good. I think let's start now. Uh, people who join will not miss anything that, sorry, who will join in a few minutes, they will not miss anything big. The first thing is we need to know what's the difference between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. That's the first question. Okay. Now, when you take the central nervous system, it consists of two parts. It should be very simple. It's the brain and the spinal cord. 
So if I was to draw a diagram, this is the central nervous system. Okay. Then we have the peripheral nervous system. So what the peripheral nervous system is, is basically anything that comes out of the nervous system. All the nerves that come out from the central nervous system, these are called the peripheral nervous system. So they can, okay, so this is the peripheral nervous system, the nerves that come out from the central nervous system. Okay, if you have any doubts, please ask. I will uh, just ask me anytime, I will stop the class and answer that question immediately. The next thing is, there's a question. There's something called the optic nerve. The one that gives you vision. So the question is, is the optic nerve a peripheral nerve? It's, is it a part of the peripheral nervous system or is it a part of the central nervous system? Now this question, it is being debated, but for your exams, for everything, uh, for any medical re related exams, you need to know that this, the cranial nerve number two, that is the optic nerve, is a central nervous system structure. Okay. This is the one exception. And this is going to be questioned. There's a disease called multiple sclerosis. This is going to be questioned. Now I'm sure that you guys have learned for histology about the neuron, the cell body. So guys, I'm going to be asking questions. You need to be able to answer, okay? What are these structures I'm drawing coming out here? Dendrite. Can someone? Dendrite. Yes. Yes. Dendrite. Yes. What is the long structure Dendrite. which I'm? Dendrite. Dendrite. Yes. Okay. So it's good that you guys know. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Do you think this is a motor nerve or a sensory nerve or an intermediate nerve? Intermediate nerve. Intermediate nerve. So motor or intermediate. It can be both. Motor intermediate. Okay. Uh, these are the three. I will come back to this. What do you call this structure which is present here? Myelin sheet. Myelin sheet. Myelin sheet. Now, this is important because the myelin sheath is needed for something called salted salted So the signal will come from here. It has to travel to here. How it goes is if it is myelinated from these wounds. So. Uh, uh, so it jumps from these nodes. These are called the nodes of Ranveer. Okay. Now this is basic physiology, basic histology. And over here, it joins with the second neuron. Over here, it's going to join with the second neuron. And this, look at this structure. Can you guys tell me, is this a motor? Sensory or intermediate ne neuron? This is intermediate. Intermediate. Yes. yes. And there's going to be a, the third neuron. So, which is going to look like this. It is going to have its two ends like this and the cell body in the middle. Pseudo unipolar. Pseudo, pseudo unipolar neurons. So now look at what I did. For the intermediate neuron, I did not draw the myelin sheath. But for the uh, axon and the, sorry, the motor neuron, this is a motor neuron. And the sensory neuron, I drew ax, uh, the myelin sheath. I'm going to ask a simple question. What is the color of myelin? White. 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 It's white, okay. And then what is the color of uh, the this part? of the cell body? Gray. Gray. Yes. 
Great. Now I hope you guys understand where the white matter and the gray matter of the nervous system comes from. So in the spinal cord, if you, okay, don't draw this because we are going to draw this several times over. I just want to show you the white matter and the gray matter distribution. Is it A or B, which is going to be the gray matter? A. A is the gray matter. So uh, this is the gray matter, okay? But in the brain, let's take a cross section of the brain. Okay, uh, I'm not going to draw the, okay. Uh, is it A or B, which will have the gray matter? A. 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 Know these, right? These are just some basic stuff I need you to understand. So, what is this? Okay, uh, let me use a different color. What is this part that goes in? And this part is something basic. Now, let's reiterate something. Whenever you hear that there's gray matter, it simply means that there are these cell bodies. You get the cell bodies. Okay? Whenever you see a part which is white matter, it means that the axons, that the neurons are either going up, down, wherever they are going, they're just going down. And because of the myelin present, it's going to appear white, okay? That is like the basic knowledge of um, the, okay, that's the, the basic introduction I can give you guys. Next, I will do a bit on the development of the nervous system. Like it's not, so, okay. Uh, You guys know there's something called the embryonic disc, yes. trilamina disc. Okay. You don't need this much, uh, guys. You don't need this much detail. I just want to make sure you guys understand everything. So there's three parts. There's the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Yes. Yes. Ectoderm. ectoderm. So think of it like this. The ectoderm, from the name you can see, it means outside. It forms the nervous system and the skin, the structures of the skin, okay? The mesoderm forms the middle structures. Can you guys give me an example? Uh, muscles Muscles, bones, connective tissues, vital organs. Yes. And then the endoderm, the main development is going to be the internal It's the GI tract, but I drew here. It is going to be from the endoderm. Okay. Now, there's something called the pharyngeal arches. Okay. So uh, it is literally the area between the hyoid bone. It develops in the area bit, uh, you know, close to the hyoid bone. And it actually gives rise to the arch of aorta, all of those structures. Okay. This region, the palate, all of this, it is innovated. It is developed from something called the pharyngeal arches. Okay. And for now, just for now, remember this as something special. Just for now, remember this as something special, okay? The pharyngeal arches, okay, now is something special. I'll come to that. The ectoderm forms a structure called the neural plate. So it forms a structure called the neural plate. And just below that, there's going to, it's going to differentiate into Two structures. Neural. One is called the neural, uh, neural crest. Yeah. Neural crest cells. 
I actually like this class because you guys are answering, so it makes me also motivated to do better than I usually would. So there's the neural plate. Here's the neural plate. Sorry, give me a second. This is the neural plate, and here's the not neural tube. Neural tube. So uh, there's going to be some cells which are neural called neural crust. Yes. Neural crust. Neural crust cells. Yes. Exactly. The thing about these neural crust cells are they migrate. Okay. They have this propensity to migrate, and you can actually find them in the heart also. Uh, the neural crest cells form in embryology. You will learn that they par form part of the heart, the septum. So if there's a, a defect in the neural crest cell, there can be uh, diseases related to the heart. Okay, this forms mostly the PNS, but has the ability to migrate. Basically, it forms the PNS because it can migrate. Okay. So the other thing is it forms melanocytes. Okay, that part is not really needed for neuroanatomy, but let's say the neural tube will differentiate into the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so I hope you guys understood this. Okay. Now, okay, uh, remember this special thing, I will come to this. I will now talk about something called a reflex, the reflex arc, okay? So let's say, let's say you keep your finger near a candle or someone without knowing you take a finger near a candle, okay? You are thinking of something else and without knowing, when you bring it close to the candle, you will automatically, you don't need to think about it, you will take your fingers out. That is called the reflex arc. So in the reflex arc, the signal goes from the finger. There's going to be receptors. What type of receptors will detect this situation? Sorry? Free nerve Free nerve. Okay. No, uh, simple name. Uh, just call them pain receptors. Okay. Pain receptors. Free nerve endings. Uh, yeah, yeah, you are correct. I didn't hear it properly. Free nerve endings. Basically, it's this literally these ne neuronal ends will detect the pain. Also, there's a temperature change. It doesn't matter. Uh, we'll focus on the pain and it will transmit the signal. It's a sensory neuron. Okay. It will transmit the signal to the spinal cord okay to transmit the signal to the spinal cord don't draw this yet we will come back to this can someone tell me why i drew this enclosure around the sensory neurons cell body what is this part called ganglion dorsal root ganglion dorsal root ganglion okay so you guys are really good with uh, histology so that's actually good now the intermediate neuron, it's in the gray matter region of the spinal cord and it will transmit the signals to the motor neuron and the motor neuron innervates the muscles. So the muscles of the finger or of all of these will be asked to take, it, take the finger away. That is called the reflex arc, okay? Now, uh, let's go to the next one. There are some words I need you guys to understand. One is called somatic. The other one is visceral. Okay. Big words literally should not scare you some of the simplest meanings. Okay. Can someone tell me what is visceral? What does visceral mean? Okay. Smooth muscles. Someone said internal organs. That's the yeah. answer. So somatic means body wall. Body wall. That means, yes. Muscles. 
tendons, all of those, uh, it comes under body, uh, under somatic. Okay. So whenever you hear something that says somatic motor, can someone tell me? Give me an example of a muscle or an organ. Somatic Skeleton. motor. Muscle. Yeah. Okay. Then somatic sensory. Uh, basically the skin. Nothing much. Uh, it's basically something which is on the skin, not an internal organ. Okay. When I say internal organ, think of the heart, liver, kidney, whatever internal organ which is there. Because they will also have some sort of uh, visceral motor. Okay. Uh, it is involuntary. Visceral motor, somatic motor is voluntary muscles, voluntary control. While visceral, it's involuntary. You don't control your GI tract in the way it moves. Okay? Stuff like that. Now, that's just a simple introduction to those two words. Uh, whenever you see that, do not get scared. Just read those words one by one. The next word they will add is general versus special. Okay. Now, what I need you to understand is general is literally everything else other than the structures that derive from the pharyngeal arches. Okay. That is skin, skeletal muscles, uh, the visceral organs, all of those, they are general. In, uh, don't worry, I, I have never seen an exam where they would ask you what are the sp uh, special organs, but special are the structures that derive from the pharyngeal arches. This is the break, uh, this region, this, any innovation in this region is usually from the special visceral st stuff, like the pharyngeal, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. The smell, olfactory, uh, that kind of things is from the special. Okay. And these are uh, special visceral efferent or from yes. the pharyngeal arches. Yes, special visceral efferent, special visceral efferents also can be present. Okay. There yeah, because like yeah. in our in our PPT, it was given like only special visceral efferent are from pharyngeal gill slits, like pharyngeal gill arches of the embryo. Okay, let me send you an image. And for for if yeah. for a sensory, it was given eye and ear, like yeah, it's mainly the eye and, and equilibrium. Ear. It's mainly the eye and ear. Uh, but okay, let me just send you a diagram. After this, special somatic afferents are considered the retina, auditory, and vestibular organs. Okay, I'll send you an image after this. Uh, just remember it as special is structures which is got to, which has got to do with the pharyngeal arches. The muscles of that region, all of those are innovated by special visceral afferents. Sorry, special somatic afferents. Afferents. Afferent versus afferents. Can someone tell me the difference? Afferent is somatic and afferent is motor. What? Sensory and motor. Afferents is somatic and afferents is motor. It's sensory. sensory. Sen sorry, sorry, sensory, yeah. sorry. Sensory and motor, sorry. Miss okay. slip of tongue. Yeah. So uh, this is the basic thing. Now, the next thing is, I need you, you guys to understand what's the difference between a nerve fiber and a nerve. Nerve fiber is a single... Uh, Unmyelinated axon. A group of nerve fibers. Yeah, a group of fibers form a nerve. Okay. So the nerve can be a motor nerve. It could be a sensory or it could be mixed. Okay. Next. We'll go directly. Okay, I'm going to do the spinal cord first. Sorry, the central nervous system first because the peripheral nervous system, it 
it's going to take a long time and uh, right now it's late in some countries so i don't want to do the peripheral nervous system first i will do that tomorrow okay uh, let's do the spinal cord now the first thing is okay uh, so don't worry too much about what's written uh, it's just easy for me to explain the stuff this is something i use for my other classes okay so first thing okay uh, let's first understand the uh, divisions of the spinal cord so we have the cerebrum the temporal lobe the midbrain the pons the medulla and can someone tell me what is the what is this opening called which are given green magnum foramen sorry oh, yes magnum magnum, magnum. magnum. Foramen. it's foramen magnum okay this is called the foramen magnum and guys when you draw this uh, that you should draw two bulging out regions like in the sense use a dotted line or something in the cervical region and the lumbar region there's two bulges can someone tell me why why is there a bulging out in those two regions in the cervical region and the lumbar region okay let me tell it simply in the cervical region it is going to innervate the uh, upper limbs and the lumbar region is going to innervate the lower limbs so that's why you have the uh, bulging out because two large plexuses one is called the cervical plexus is going to come out sorry brachial plexus is going to come out from this region in the bottom part the lumbar plexus will come out it's two bulging out regions so how many cervical spinal nerves are there how many cervical eight. yeah is eight. eight c1 to c8 then how many thoracic nerves are there 12 12 t1 to t12 then how many lumbar nerves are there five five then sacral four five five as one to as five and a single coccygeal nerve okay this is something you need to know there is a 81551 okay can someone tell me where does the spinal cord end what is this point what is this level at the so level of l3 l1 okay remember this uh, this will be asked as an mcq somewhere okay at the level of M l1 that's where the spinal cord ends and it forms a cone like structure can you guys tell me the name of this cone cordae cordae equina there's an okay this is the cordae equina these filaments terminalis spinal terminus okay uh, let me show that so this is the phylum terminale phylum one more name it's a cone it's called the conus medullaris conus medullaris conus medullaris okay now uh, the thing is the okay the conus medullaris is basically a cone strip uh, like structure and from there you get the corda equina fibers coming out it's very it you can never find an organized way of the corda equina like you can never say okay this is to this uh, this region this uh, nerve supplies to this it's very disorganized so uh, there is going to be <laughs> this phylum terminale it's a very thin it's a very thin uh, you can see here 
Okay. See, there is a fibrous extension that attaches to the final part of the dura mater and the coccyx. So uh, I will do the meninges, but basically it is a thin fibrous structure which goes all the way to the coccyx, okay, to the dura mater. And that is called phylum terminale. It's just a fibrous structure. Remember that, okay? Now the chorda equina has innovations to the, uh, what is it, um, genito anal region. We won't go into detail about that till you come to the peripheral nervous system. The next part is something I will quickly go through because it's there for you guys to know and this is not good, not a summary. This is an actual complete anatomy lecture. So you guys know the spinal segments of the uh, spinal cord and their relation to the vertebral column do you guys know this? Okay, let me just ask it like this. So C1 to C4 of the spinal cord correlates to which segments of the vertebral column? Okay, it correlates to, yeah, yes. Okay, same level, same level. There's an easy way to remember this, I'll show you guys. Then C5 to T4, it correlates to one segment above. So what that means is, this is going to start at C4. This is what happened here. And end at T3, okay? Just follow along with me. Then we have the T5 to T8. This is going to end at T3 and T6. It's going to start at three, T3, go up to T6. That's basically two seg segments above. Okay. And uh, there's the lumbar. Which is T, oh, sorry, I missed, sorry. Uh, T9 to T12, which goes from 369. T6 to T9. Two okay. Lum the lumbar region goes to T12. Okay. And the sacral region goes to L1. T9 to T12. This is three segments. Okay, guys, uh, let me just show you how to remember this. So look at this. Look at the final number. Wait. Guys, something happened. Let me figure out where I went wrong. Give me a second. I... Let me open the PPT. So C1 to C4 will be C1 to C4. C5 to T4, it will be C4 to T3. Then T5 to T8 will be 6, 3, 6, 9, 12. Oh yeah, it's correct. So guys, look at this. Look at this variation, 3, 6, 9, 12. And look at this variation, 4, 8, 12. Okay? I just try to remember it like that, if uh, the vertebrae and the spinal segment. Can someone now tell me, why does this happen? Why does the spinal cord overtake the vertebrae? Can someone just think? 
because the spinal cord terminate before the vertebral column terminate yeah no uh, but i'm asking is till here it came together like c1 c2 c3 c4 they came together but as after, we grow uh, the spinal cord grows uh, the vertebral column grows but spinal cord doesn't yes in the sense the have you seen the size of the cervical vertebrae this the vertebrae becomes larger as you go down to be able to bear the weight of the body the lumbar region all of those have huge uh, huge vertebral bodies so basically it has already overtaken the uh, like by the time t1 has come here okay let's say t12 has come here this is still somewhere t3 okay not t3 sorry uh, t9 sorry uh, same do you guys understand this because the vertebral cell body becomes larger that's why the spinal segments overtake the vertebral column don't get confused just remember uh, these they can ask it I, i'm not sure so the next thing i will talk about the structure of the spinal cord give me one second guys if you have any questions till now please ask okay okay uh before i go to the structure of the spinal cord i will do the um meninges of the spinal cord and the brain now what are the three meninges of the body of the brain spinal cord pyramidal pyramidal and arachnoid yeah so you guys know that so let me show you guys how i usually draw this okay uh first of all i'm going to draw the normal brain is the cordina corners medullaris and the phylum terminal okay now what i'm going to draw outside is going to be the dura mater okay guys what i'm doing right now is found in the beginning of uh, the cns chapter the and at the end of cns chapter where they have the topic on meninges i'm doing both at the same time so what i'm drawing right now is the outermost that's the dura mater okay just draw it with me okay the phylum terminale from the spinal cord comes all the way and attaches to the dura mater okay now i need you to appreciate that fact okay so let's assume this level is l1 okay oh sorry 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 my bad this is l l1 let's assume okay this is l1 now guys sorry sorry uh, i early i made a mistake the l1 should be just below the corners medullaris okay when you pierce the needle in you cannot damage that okay forget this is the dura mater that's the outermost okay and this is a firm white connective tissue there's a celebration happening at the piece that's why you guys can hear the uh, stuff now draw the meninges with me this is the dura mater what is below the dura mater arachnoid arachnoid what is below the arachnoid phylum phylum what is between the arachnoid and the phylum mater hmm? sub dura sub arachnoid space sub arachnoid space yes and here we have the phylum mater okay now i need you guys to un understand the importance of this okay there is going to be blood vessels that will come like this and they will form these outgrowths what's it 
can someone uh, name this? What are these outgrowths? These are called choroid plexus. Can someone tell me the function of choroid plexus? CSF secretion. CSF secretion. Now let's take a look at the uh, choroid plexus a bit deeper. Okay, uh, guys, the this entire structure is called the choroid plexus. But what comes out through the prior matter has another name. You will see this some uh, in uh, uh, the PPT of ever. Telacordia. Okay. So, guys, uh, yeah. someone's microphone is making some good noises. So, yeah, okay. So, this is the structure of a choroid plexus. Does anyone know the name of this lining cells? Appendimals? Yes. Perfect. These are ependymal cells. You can pronounce it anyway. Ependymal, ependymal cells. And inside this, you have the capillary loops. You have the blood vessels. Uh, these are capillaries, basically. Now, what is important is, uh, this is something you will learn for pharmacology, for physiology, how fluids leave. So, first of all, sodium will leave. Uh, there's going to be a sodium efflux. You don't need this. Don't try this. I just want you to understand what happens here. Okay? Sodium leaves, and wherever sodium goes, just remember this about your medical carrier. Wherever sodium goes, water follows. Okay? Water follows. Not only sodium, other stuff will also leak out from these capillaries, and that's what creates the CSF. Okay? This is what creates the cerebrospinal fluid. There's going to be nutrition, such as glucose, uh, everything. So there's a system of recycling. Things go out, things come back in. This is the normal system, okay? But if there is a blockage, let's say there's a tumor growing here. In the brain, there's a tumor growing here. This is a tumor. Can you guys see that this uh, inflow, outflow pathway has been blocked? Can someone give me the name of this condition? Hydrocephalus. Yes. Can you tell me the meaning of hydrocephalus? Uh, more CSF will accumulate in the brain. In, uh, Not CSF. Collection of CSF. Okay. Particular, particular. Uh, just break down the name. Uh, hydrocephalus, just break down the name. What is hydro? Water. Water. Yes. Water. What is cephalus? Brain, uh, head. Head. Brain. Or brain. So basically, water accumulates in the head, and this usually affects babies before they are born. They have a massive head. Okay, these are guys. You might assume this is neurology, but trust me, this is a part of neuroanatomy. This can come. Okay, this is all taken from the anatomy books, the PPTs and stuff. Okay. I'm not doing anything neurology related. Everything I'm doing is needed for neuroanatomy. I need to be clear because my program usually combines both together. Okay. Uh, so I need you guys to write this in red and remember this forever. Okay. The circle of villus is found floating in the subarachnoid space. The circle of villus is found floating in the subarachnoid space. Okay? That means our 
brain's arterial system is found floating in the subarachnoid space let me just show you guys the location so we have a gland here which looks like this that secretes hormones what is this gland called pituitary yeah it's a pituitary so i have to expand this part so basically the circle of villus is found encircling the pituitary stalk okay think of the stalk and think of the circle of villus uh, if you don't know what the circle of villus is uh, we will do that uh, later in the lecture but it is the arterial supply to the brain okay the circle of villus is found surrounding the is, so guys uh, i muted you all but please unmute and answer you can press space and you can answer okay okay now tell me what is the we do two tests we do two things with this csa okay one of them is called a lumbar puncture the other one is called an epidural where you give painkillers anesthesia epidurals okay so oh i did this wrong the epidural has to come just over here guys unmute and talk what is the what is the function of a lumbar puncture why do people do a lumbar puncture bone marrow aspiration sorry csf out yes bone marrow aspiration no not bone marrow aspiration csf test csf to draw csf let's say to extract csf exactly so let's say there's an infection let's say there's an infection of the csf it's called meningitis it's menin it's the meninges being infected it is called meningitis so what you do is you take a sample to test it okay now here are the layers you go through to basically get the csf out okay first we have the skin next we have the fascia and fat next we have something called the supra spinous ligament guys this will be asked okay inter spinous fibrous yes. what's, ligament what's the next one ligamentum flava yes. ligamentum flava nice what is the next one okay the epidural space okay this is the epidural space and the epidural anesthesia needle stops here if you are giving the patient an epidural the epidural anesthesia must stop here you never go beyond this okay i'll tell the reason why next can someone tell me what is next so guys dura uh, yeah yeah it's the dura dura next arachnoid yes what's the final one subarachnoid yes and this is where you do a lumbar puncture subarachnoid space okay now look at this diagram and tell me Uh, is it possible to do an epidural where you want first question is it possible to do an epidural anywhere you want or not like anywhere from here to here yes yeah. yes yes what about a lumbar puncture no no l1 to l4 only after l1 there is only cord i can see yes that's where you go in and actually it's not l1 it's l3 it's between l3 
L4 and L5. So you go in between these spaces for a lumbar puncture. Can someone tell me why you can't do a lumbar puncture anywhere you want? Simple logic. It's not hard. Why can't you do a lumbar puncture anywhere? So basically, lumbar puncture can be done in this region only. But the epidural can be done literally anywhere. Wherever you want the blockage, if wherever you want the anesthesia to work, let's say you want to numb an upper part of the body, you give it somewhere here in the back, top areas. Okay? Can someone tell me it's very obvious? Why do why can't you do a lumbar puncture anywhere? So it can damage spinal cord. Exactly. Very simple. It can damage the spinal cord. Because just imagine you're coming so close to the spinal cord. Okay. Spinal cord. Like right below this is the weakest part. That is the pyre matter. And after the pyre matter, it's going to be the spinal cord. Okay. So uh, remember that and understand this. You need to be able to write this for anatomy, for anesthesiology, and I'm not sure if you need this for surgery. For anesthesiology, you need this. They always ask that as a question. Now, let me talk about the drainage. So, okay, uh, we will go into detail about these structures. For now, just put on uh, meninges of the spinal cord and brain. I will tell the drainage pathway of the CSR. So we have the choroid plexus. Write it two times. They will drain into the lateral ventricles. Lateral ventricles. There's two lateral ventricles. That's why you, I do it like this. And they together will drain to something called the third ventricle. Okay. And the third ventricle will drain into something called the cerebral aqueduct, which will drain into the fourth ventricle. Okay. And that has actually several openings. Just write this down. I will explain all of this. There's two lateral openings and one medial opening. This is called, the lateral openings are called the foramen of Lushaka and the medial opening is called the Magendi's foramen. They won't ask you those names. Uh, need to uh, remember these names okay and from the fourth ventricle from these openings they will drain into the subarachnoid space subarachnoid space and through that so they will basically enter here and go to the dural blood vessels there are some blood vessels in the dura matter their final goal is to go enter those blood vessels okay subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus of dura and the, that drains to the internal jugular vein. I understand this might be a bit confusing. This might be a lot. Don't worry. We will come to this when we do the uh, brainstem. Okay. I'm going to explain these ventricles, everything in a way that you will remember. So don't worry too much. Okay. The final goal is to enter the uh, dura matter where it will drain to the internal jugular vein. Okay. So next, let's talk about the spinal cord. The anatomy of the spinal cord. Okay. I need a blank page. Okay, let's use this. 
So just draw this with me. For ease, I usually do this. I because I can erase with this. I usually do this and erase the middle part. Okay. Now, guys, what is this structure? Pramin Central. Central. Central canal. Central canal. Central canal. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I need you guys to understand this. So I'm going to draw some neuronal cell bodies. Give me a second. Give me a second, guys. So the thing is, neuroanatomy, neurology is actually very easy. If you learn it in a very artistic way, like instead of memorizing things, if you learn to draw this, like the way I would study this is, I would keep drawing this over and over. I wouldn't go to write stuff because when you draw it, it stores it longer in your brain first thing and you understand it better. So, give me a second, guys. Okay, uh, let's do it like this. So what I'm drawing right now, are they motor or sensory neuronal bodies? Are they motor or sensory neuronal bodies? Just guess. Motor. 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 Yes. Motor. Yes. I'm using two colors for a reason. What I want to say is this, what I'm drawing here is the axial. These will supply the axial muscles. That is muscles in this axis, like the straight axis. Your, let's take your rectus abdominis. All of those muscles will, will be supplied by this region. Okay. And the most anterior region is going to be the uh, it will be the uh, neuronal cell bodies that supplies the limbs. Okay. These are motor neuron neurons. Okay. I hope you guys understand this. Don't please ask. The anterior part of the spinal cord is for the motor segment. Okay. The posterior part of the spinal cord is for the sensory neurons. So these are sensory neurons. Uh, sensory neuronal cell bodies. Okay. If you don't understand, please ask. Now, let me show you guys the other thing which we didn't go into much detail. What is this structure, which comes from the rear? Guys, unmute and speak. Dorsal root ganglion. Yes. Okay. So those neurons will come here, and then they will form the intermediate neurons in this intermediate region. And finally, form a, a motor connection here. From here, supply the muscles. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, this two words I need you to understand. What is a funiculus? And what is a fasciculus? Does anyone know what a funiculus is? Bundle of edge zones. Yes, it means a big bundle. 
and uh, you are correct when you said uh, accents because it is yeah that's correct uh, it is a big bundle of accents okay so is it present here or here the funiculus the posterior side yeah so you guys understand that a fasciculus literally means small bundle like you can uh, google it it means small bundle okay and uh, let me show you guys what it means so this is okay can you guys name this is this a uh, the lateral medial or the posterior funiculus i know the answer this is the lateral funiculus what is this then what is this over here dorsal or posterior dorsal anterior dorsal or posterior posterior funiculus funiculus posterior funiculus and this is the anterior funiculus okay uh, guys i'm just showing you guys how to label the structures okay now the next thing is the fasciculus look at this now i'm going to fasciculus i'm dividing the posterior funiculus into two parts into four parts actually this do you guys know this fasciculus pronotus and fasciculus gracilis have you guys heard of this one of them supplies the leg can you guys guess which supplies the leg is it the first one or the second one first one okay that remember it like this the way i remember it is gracilis sounds like graceful okay and uh, i link it to graceful legs okay this is the gracilis fasciculus gracilis okay and this is the fasciculus cuneatus okay next uh so guys i need you to, to understand whenever you come uh, come across anything related to the nervous system is 100% symmetrical okay whatever you get on the left side same thing can be found on the right side okay the nervous system is 100% symmetrical okay uh let's go to the facts guys right now we are doing the kind of okay for me personally i find this part to be boring so uh, bear with me because i will try to make it as interesting as i possibly can because this is very important okay now if you guys have any questions please ask okay fasciculus is the small bundle of axons only yes white matter bundles fasciculus okay. these two terms relate to white matter bundle of axons and that's the big bundle what you mean sorry uh, basically uh, funiculus is the big bundle of axon and fas fasciculus is the small bundle of axon only yeah uh, so this large segment this entire segment is the posterior funiculus while the fasciculus is basically we have divided it into this and this it's like smaller bundles okay basic these are just names to group things together basically okay and uh, guys i will give you guys a way to remember this fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus and why the fasciculus gracilis is in the middle and why the fasciculus cuneatus is in the uh, side now you guys should know that the spinal cord is a tapering structure okay the spinal cord is a tapering structure 
So it's not as think of the spinal cord as you go down to not be as fat. It will be something small as you go down. Okay. So it doesn't have space for the fasciculus cuneatus yet. Near the legs, it only has space. Think I drew a circle around it. It only has a space for the fasciculus gracilis. Okay. That's why this fasciculus gracilis, which is in the medial side, should ease the legs because it grows outwards. Like the spinal cord is going to grow. Think of it as growing like this. You guys can see my camera. It is going to, as you go up, it is going to expand. And as you go up, the fasciculus cuneatus also gets added. Somewhere around here, the fasciculus cuneatus gets added. It's just a way for you guys to remember which is in the middle, which is in the lateral aspect. Okay. Next, we'll talk about, okay. Uh, let me talk about something I find interesting before I come back to something boring again. Let's talk about Okay, uh, let me select a topic. Let's talk about the circle of Willis. I hope you guys know what the, okay. Have at least heard of what the circle of Willis is. Sorry guys, I couldn't, uh, let me delete these. Okay, first thing. I'm going to teach you guys how to draw the circle of Willis and also to read a MRI. Like you will see this MRI very often in the hospital. Okay. This MRI, it's very common in the hospital. This is the blood supply of our brain. And this is called the circle of Willis. These two arteries form the vertebral arteries. Okay. These two form the vertebral arteries. That forms a very thick, large one which travels upwards along the uh, brainstem. It is called the basilar artery. Okay. And here we have something called the anterior cerebral artery. Okay. Here we have the middle cerebral artery. And the one that gave rise to both of these is the internal carotid artery. Okay, it's called the internal carotid artery. And this is the posterior cerebral artery. Guys, if you don't understand, please ask. This is very important. Middle cerebral arteries. Okay, uh, I will draw this again and show you guys. Uh, practice drawing it, it's very important. See, you can see the brain stem. You can see the vertebral arteries, you can see the basilar arteries going up, and the posterior cerebral arteries actually go back. Like, there's no way for me to show it coming out of the screen. So, that's the posterior circulation. Now I'm going to show you how to draw this. Okay. We have two vertebral arteries. One on either side. They form a larger basilar artery, which gives rise to several branches, including the pontine artery. Can someone tell me what does the pontine artery supply? Pons. Then the labyrinthine, labyrinthine arteries. And another one called the AICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Okay, and that comes to the top to form this circular structure. Okay, and the rest is easy. Here's the 
posterior cerebral arteries. I told you everything is symmetrical. Then the middle cerebral arteries. And the anterior cerebral arteries. Okay. Can someone tell me what is this artery called? Does anyone know Internal that? It has the communicate. It has the word communicating. Anterior communicating artery. So what is the name of this one then? Sorry. Uh, what is the name of this one? Posterior communicating. Posterior communicating artery. Okay. Actually, it's whole, this whole thing, uh, since I'm not drawing it in 3D, it's going to get confusing, but uh, uh, this is the basic structure. Now, can someone tell me what is the importance of having a circle like this? Okay, let's say there's a block here, okay? So that means, let's say this region is not going to get any blood. What happens is the blood is able to go around a circle and somehow figure out a way to uh, give blood to the, uh, this region. That is the importance of this circle structure, okay? And there's one artery which is very commonly occluded, it is called the lenticulo striate artery, okay? It's called the lenticulo striate artery. And you guys need to remember this as the most commonly occluded artery. Occluded means blocked, okay? Lenticulo striate artery is the most commonly occluded artery and I will come back to this, okay? I will come back to this. You guys need to know this, okay? Next. Guys, take a screenshot of this. Uh, take a screenshot of this. This cavernous sinus structures. So uh, I will explain that in a minute. But before that, I want to, okay, I will go back to the spinal cord and finish these descending and ascending tracks. Give me a second, guys. Okay, uh, we are going to do the spinal cord ascending and the descending tracks. I, I don't have space here, I will at a page. Okay. Do you guys know of these tracks? Does anyone here know about these tracks? Okay, I'm going to assume uh, that you haven't learned this. And I'm going to do it from the beginning, okay? Spinal cord, descending tracks. Guys, I will stop the class at 10. It will be two hours. And uh, to, by tomorrow, I will upload the PNS part and whatever is left of the CNS, okay? Okay, so do you know what this region is? If you take this, there's this huge sulcus in the middle of the brain. Do you know what this is called? Central sulcus. Yes. Okay, uh, this region, is it a motor or a sensory region? This region. Motor. 
Yes, this is the pre pre motor region, guys. Uh, I got confused here. I need to double check this. Yes, you are correct. Sorry, I got confused for a second. What is this region called? What is this region called? If that's the pre-motor, this region. Okay, understand this. The central sulcus divides the motor region from the sensitive region in the cortex. The pre-motor region is going to be divided by the sensory region, basically. Okay. And now I'm going to tell you guys something related to the topic language. I need you guys to think and answer. There is something called the Broca's area. This is related to language, not related to the descending tracts. And this is called the Wernicke's area. Actually, it is close to this sulcus. It's fine. When we come to that, I'll do that. So can someone tell me what is one of them does the function of? Yeah, one does the function of reception of uh, or hearing. Speech is broken. I understand. Okay, so speak. How many says? Uh, how many says it brokers? Does everyone say brokers? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then uh, understanding, like what you hear, understand. You guys understand that it is a sensory function. Okay. So uh, I need you guys to remember this when you come to the topic brokers and Wernicke's because you need to understand the de deficit of these two. So a patient who has a damage to the Broca's area cannot speak or whatever he says is uh, illiterate. Like you don't understand what that person is saying. It's a deficiency in speech production. Okay. Wernicke's area, it's not... Uh, these people, okay, they are the ones who are illiterate. They don't know what they're saying. They think they hear something, but they say something else. Okay, they have a deficit in reception and understanding, and then they will speak something else. Okay, that's a sensory region. That is the importance of this central sulcus. The other importance of the central sulcus, I'll come to that. In a while. For now, let's focus on uh, this situation right now. Okay. First of all, we have areas of the premotor region which will supply nerves, like our voluntary movement from the limbs. Sorry, to the Okay, I, do you guys know how a thought is made into movement? I'll quickly tell you guys how it happens. So there is this region is your thinking and your planning department. What it does is it is going to tell these regions you are going to move your feet. Okay, they're going to tell different regions you are going to move your feet and they will load the program into this region where the nerves will carry the impulse to those muscles, okay? That is something uh, not relevant to our topic, but just understand that, okay? You need to know this pathway. These neurons will enter the posterior limb of internal capsule. Okay, this will enter the posterior limb of the internal capsule and they will exit at a place called the pyramid. Okay.
so these neurons will exit at a place called the pyramids okay now something happens in the pyramid which is very important 75% of these fibers will cross to the other side okay 75% of these fibers cross to opposite side okay while the remaining 25 go along the pathway it came so the ones that went along its pathway will supply the axial muscles while the ones that crossed to the opposite side will supply the limbs okay guys if you don't understand please ask okay because i know for a fact most of you have not watched the video and the moment you open the ppt you will get scared okay uh sorry let's draw the spinal cord now so uh, the ones that are going to the limb will come from something called the lateral this is called the lateral cortico spinal tract cortico spinal tract okay and the ones which are coming from the axial muscles will come to something called the anterior anterior cortico spinal tract okay so what happens here is these neurons let's say this at this level it is your finger which is supposed to be moved these neurons will exit whatever is needed to be given to that area will exit there guys please listen to this part it's going to be the most important thing that i will discuss and the most complicated okay it is going to come the okay it's not going to be uh, one neuron there's going to be multiple there's going to be thousands of neurons coming down but the one that exits at this level will come out from here and will leave from this region okay do you guys understand this if you don't please ask okay so this is the one that will supply let's say the arm okay and the ones that are supplying the leg will keep going down do you guys understand this if not please ask okay now let me talk about what happens to the anterior cortical spinal tract fibers okay no no i'm not going to add that it might confuse you guys do you guys understand this i'm going to now talk about something called the upper motor neuron injuries and the lower motor neuron injuries okay this came for us in a mcq and uh, for your anatomy paper there will be 10 questions which which will be multiple choice not single choice it will be multiple choice so you need to be able to answer that and this was very important there was i think two to three questions which came from this guys draw this with me i'm just drawing the brain then that spinal cord this that i drew there okay now i hope you guys understood the fibers that come will continue going down while the ones which are supposed to exit at that level will exit at that level okay
let's say just imagine there is a damage to this nerve okay there is a damage to this nerve and since this is the nerve that exit at whatever level this concept please understand really well this is very important let me let me show it in a different way so the i told you guys what i'm drawing right now is this area okay this part those neurons will come and one of the neurons will exit into the anterior horn and it will form a synapse where a new neuron will carry the signal forward okay do you guys understand this at this point this is what happens the neuron will exit and give rise to a second neuron it will give rise to a different neuron which goes and supplies the muscle okay now what i need you guys to understand is this is called a lower motor neuron okay that means it has it is at a certain level it didn't come from the brain or the spinal cord uh, sorry it didn't come from the brain okay it didn't come from above while this is considered an upper motor neuron i just need you guys to understand this concept okay this if you let's say there's a damage to this neuron here what happens is this lower motor neuron will exhibit these symptoms this let's say there's a damage at a certain level at that level the muscles okay let's say this nerve innervates the muscles of your fingers let's say of these fingers those muscles will be weak okay okay let's take the elbow this elbow will be weak that person's muscles will be wasting okay and also you know the hammer which you hit to check for the tendon reflex that will show no reflexes okay loss of tendon reflex there's a table which you need to memorize in uh, the powerpoints there's going to be loss of tendon reflex okay and there's something called the babinski sign there's something called the babinski sign okay that is going to be negative so understand that the second neuron which exit at this level will undergo this damage but let's say the damage is here let's say the damage is here or let's say the damage is here basically the same thing in the upper motor neuron okay then everything goes up the the leg and everything becomes spastic like they will be spasming they will be contracted and uh, when you uh, use the hammer and hit they will have sudden increased reflex okay and something called the babinski sign i will now show you what the babinski sign is so the babinski sign is you ask the patient to lie down and he keeps his feet like this and what you do is you take a sharp let's say a key something that is a bit sharp but won't damage the person's leg and you take it so this is the big toe you move it this way so your feet if this is your feet you take it like this okay you take the key like this if the toe raises if the toe lifts up if the, i can't show my toes but basically if the toe lifts up that means there is a upper motor neuron damage it could be somewhere here it could be somewhere here somewhere here okay there is an upper motor neuron damage the way to remember this is for upper motor neurons everything goes up for lower motor neurons everything goes down 
okay if there is a damage to the neuron at the level of exit everything goes down while for upper motor neuron everything goes up just remember it like that for mcqs you should be able to figure out the answer okay that is very important and that will come as an mcq next i will do the okay uh, i did the descending tracks so this descending tract carries the motor innervation let's now talk about the sensory innervation spinal cord let's take the dorsal column tract so we are now doing the second tract this is the tract okay. guys if you have any questions please ask you can unmute ask and because these are some concepts which are a bit heavy which if you don't understand you won't um be able to score well so here's the fasciculus what is this fasciculus cuneatus or the gracilis cuneatus yes the other one is fasciculus gracilis okay we are now going to learn about those tracts now the lower motor neurons again that concept but it's not relevant like we are earlier it was about the oh yeah sorry these are low was sensory neurons not motor neurons they will come and they will form a new neuron which will enter this fasciculus cuneatus or the gracilis if it is from the uh, arms it will be the fasciculus cuneatus gets that nerve if it is from the leg the fasciculus gracilis will get that and the signal will go up to the brain okay so that the basic thing what happens is the signal will go up in these neurons to something called the gracile tubercle this four two on either sides Gra uh, cuneate tubercle sorry and the gracile to sorry nuclei nuclei sorry guys these are nuclei nucleus they will go to these two nucleus and from there they will form fibers which are called internal arcuate fibers which cross to the other side okay so they form internal arcuate fibers which cross to the other side okay you will get questions to determine which side the damage is and that goes to a structure called the thalamus okay it goes to a structure called the thalamus it's actually so the thalamus the way you draw it is you draw a circle and you draw a y so this is the gray matter region of the thalamus and the neurons will come to actually this area it's called the ventral posterolateral nucleus of thalamus big names don't worry so that will go to the post central gyrus the third neuron 
a third neuron will start sorry to go to the post central gyrus not the precentral gyrus now it's the post central gyrus okay this is the pathway of the um, sensory fibers you guys need to understand this okay and uh, one thing the teachers are very lenient for online exams when they are marking they know the situation they know everything the teachers are very lenient when it comes to marking online exams so my advice do the exams online because the teachers know that the students are getting the paper by screenshots they will never give you the same paper when you go back like uh, the paper that you will get for the online exam will be way easier compared to what you will get when you go back now okay so let me talk about the function of this dorsal column we talked about the pathway we didn't talk about the function it's two things fine touch and proprioception okay does anyone know what fine touch is can anyone tell me what is fine touch okay fine touch is basically you ask the patient to close the eyes and you keep two objects which are very close to each other and ask them to say if they can feel them as one object or two objects with their eyes closed one or two objects okay you can try it on yourselves with the eyes closed it's very hard but for at least at a certain point you are able to tell that difference for these patients they cannot discriminate to touch okay you can uh, be touching him like this he cannot tell that you are using two fingers okay that's fine touch proprioception just listen to this it is the knowledge our body's knowledge of where all the joints are now you know uh, proprioception basically means it's our body's basic knowledge it always knows where each joint is so uh, subconsciously our brain knows that the uh, the knee is bent it knows to what degree it is bent okay otherwise what will happen is these people will be walking in a very unsteady way because the body doesn't know where the legs are they don't know where the where to keep the legs okay they don't know what is a normal movement proprioception is um just knowledge of where joints muscles tendons etc okay that is what you call proprioception now guys uh that's for that next we'll talk about the spinothalamic tracts give me a second okay sorry guys i will finish the spinal cord today the rest it, uh i will upload a video those who are interested you can watch it but yeah so next let's talk about the spinothalamic tract so we are going to talk about the spinothalamic tract does anyone know what the spinothalamic tract function is and temperature i remember it look at this spine there's a p here and temperature there's a lot of t's in this name so 
pain and temperature okay and this you guys need to understand this concept draw two layers of the spinal cord draw two layers of the spinal cord. What happens is the pain and the temperature fibers, the pain and the temperature fibers will come and they will ascend before they cross. They will ascend around two to three segments. Okay. They will ascend to two to three segments. And then they will cross to the other side. Okay. So, uh, guys, there's a special region here. I didn't talk about this, but I have to. This is a white matter region, and it is where most fibers. Cross. Does anyone know the name of this? It's called the anterior white commissure. This is an area in which the fibers will cross. Okay, you get fibers crossing from this side, and you get fibers crossing from the other side, and they go up to the brain. Okay, same nucleus as before and this time i'll give you guys a mnemonic uh, something to make it easier uh, if it comes for a mcq search for the words ventral posterior vpn nucleus sorry same nucleus as before okay ventral posterior lateral nucleus vpn it'll be that's how i and that will go to the brain again to the post central gyrus. Okay. I hope you guys understand this. Now, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Okay. Don't worry, we are done with the uh, three tracks. Uh, if you guys understood this, you guys are good to go. These are the main tracks. There's some other tracks called the rub rubrospinal, spinotectal. I think uh, there's some other tracks which are called the extrapyramidal tracks. If you hear this word, you will hear this word. These are all related to posture and balance. Okay. Just remember it like that. That's way more than enough. Now, next, I'm going to ask you guys some questions because this is very important. For, okay. Uh, right till now, we did uh, dorsal column, then the corticospinal tract. I'm doing a uh, review of what we did. And this uh, spi uh, spinothalamic. Okay, we did three things. Now the dorsal column is fine touch and proprioception. Corticospinal tract, it's motor. And the spinothalamic uh, tract is pain and temperature. Okay. Do you guys understand that these two crossed at the top? These crossed, crossed at the top. Do you guys understand that? Like, look at those diagrams. Uh, they cross somewhere here. 
they crossed somewhere here. Okay. Let's now take a patient. Let's take a patient. And you have to understand that their fibers crossed here, these two. Okay. Till then, they were on the same side. Let's say there is a damage to his spinal cord. Just understand this concept. You can apply this to almost any question afterwards. Let's say there is a damage to his spinal cord on the, this is the right side, okay? You guys should know anatomical way of marking stuff. This is the right side. Will this patient have paralysis on the left or the right side? So his damage was somewhere here. Will he have the damage on the same side or the opposite side? Same opposite side. Same or opposite to it. Okay, guys. Same side. Yes, it's the same side. Uh, I guess some of you didn't understand why it's the same side. Look at this. The damage is here. Okay. Not here after it crossed. Okay. Let's say the damage happened here on the left side of the body where in the brain. Where will the damage present? Will it be on the left side or the right side? Right. Huh? It will right. still be the right side. Right. It will be the right. You guys understand, right? Uh, this track did not cross till it went to the brain. So just draw the track and figure out which side the damage is because like I can explain this in a way which you learn for neurology, but then you don't have that knowledge yet for me to go that deep. So I hope you guys understand it will be the same side. Okay. It's called ipsilateral. Okay. But when you come to the spinal thalamic tract, just remember it as contralateral. Reason it crosses within two to three segments. Okay. It has already crossed. So if there's a damage here, the manifestation will be on the opposite side. You guys understand that? Understand this fact because this is uh, like everything that I did from here comes to this point. You guys understanding this fact and you guys understanding this fact. These two are the most important things in today's lecture. So go through that if you didn't understand it. And now I did like the most difficult concept heavy parts. Now let me just go through the remaining parts will be done in soon. What I'm drawing right now is the spinal cord, okay? The blood supply of the spinal cord. This is the last part we have to do for the spinal cord, then we're done with the spinal cord. There is the anterior spinal artery going up, okay? A single anterior spinal artery, which goes up like this, anterior, spinal artery. Draw these guys. Then there is two posterior spinal arteries going up like this. And also there are some segmental arteries which innervate from either side. They come with the dorsal root ganglion and they also come with the ventral root ganglion. These are called the segmental arteries. Okay, these are called the segmental arteries and 
these three arteries groups are what innervates the spinal cord. Okay. And this final part that I'm going to do right now, it's going to be the most interesting thing because I don't think you will ever find this done anywhere else. Like, uh, let me show you guys. Uh, so I was supposed to do the brainstem, but then uh, I feel like this might be a bit concept heavy for you guys. So I don't want to do longer than two hours. Now, this is the jugular. Sorry. Uh, foramen magnum, sorry. I got cut. This is the foramen magnum. What is this then? What is the first part of the brainstem? Huh? What is the first part of the brainstem? No, no. Uh, so the brainstem is divided into three parts. What is the first part? Okay. Um, Sorry? The brain. Medulla. Medulla. Medulla oblongata. What is the middle? Oh. Oh. And what is the uppermost? Midbrain. Brain. Yes. Midbrain. Now, okay. Uh, I will actually finish the uh, brainstem today. If not, it will just be dragged. So right now I'm going to draw the ventral aspect. Okay, that is the anterior aspect. of the midbrain, of this whole thing. Now, the medulla oblongata has these things coming out like this, okay? And uh, it is called OPPO. Basically, it's symmetrical. So one, what's on one side will be on the other side. Can someone tell me what is the full name of O? Olives. Yes. What is the full name of P? Pyramid. Yes. And do you know what this is? The sulcus between the uh, medulla oblongata and the pons? Pontomedullary sulcus. That's actually good. Uh, that's a very common name which is used, but uh, for uh, China, it's uh, bulbar pontine sulcus. So there are uh, four cranial nerves that comes from the medulla oblongata. Okay, three of them comes from this region of the olive, and one of them comes from the pyramids. Like it'll come on this side of this sulcus. Okay, cranial nerves nine, ten. 11 and cranial nerve 12 comes from here. Remember this in an exam. I don't know because it's online. I oh, know you still can always use Roman numerals when you write these cranial nerves. Okay. If you write it in these numbers, that's wrong. Okay. I'm just writing it for you guys, for, the, for you guys to find it easier. Okay. Uh, do you know the uh, names of these cranial nerves. What is cranial nerve number nine? Glossopharyngeal. Yes. So, glossopharyngeal. I'll send you guys a mnemonic after this class. Uh, what is cranial nerve number 10? Vegas. Vegas. This is the one which has the parasympathetic nervous system functions. Okay. This is very important. Like all the secretions of our body, it is called, okay. The, Another name for vagus nerve is the wanderer. It literally goes all around the body and has a lot of parasympathetic functions. It increases secretion from uh, the GI tract. Uh, it slows the heart, all that kind of stuff. Okay. What is access? Uh, sorry, what is cranial nerve 11? Accessory. Yeah. Spinal accessory. Can someone tell me the two functions of the accessory nerve? Mm 
involved in uh, the trapezius muscle innervation. Like you ask the patient if they have a damage to the accessory nerve, the way you check that is you put some force here and ask the patient to shrug. You can find the weak one. The other one is the, the sterno sternocleidomastoid. They can't turn against resistance. Okay. So those two muscles are innervated by the accessory nerve. And the 12th cranial nerve, what is that called? Hypoglossal. Yes. Where does that go to? Hypoglossal. Huh? Mm -hmm. Tongue. Yes, tongue, tongue innervation, tongue. the muscles. Okay. So next, the pons. And here, remember I talked about a artery, a big artery called the basilar artery. So because of that, the pons becomes something like a convex shape, okay? It becomes a convex shape because there's a huge sulcus called the basilar sulcus. Okay? The pons has this basilar sulcus through which the basilar artery will go up and it'll give branches. This is the pontine branches, etc., which will come out. And this thing, can someone give me the name of this? This is a foot process. Okay, it's called Thanks, the cerebral. Cerebral. Yes? Superior cerebral parents. Peduncle. It's the cerebral peduncle. Okay? There's two of them. And between them, there's like a dark space, which is called the interpeduncular. Fossa. And here is where the cranial nerve number three comes out. Okay, you need this. Cranial nerve three comes out from this. And cranial nerve four. Oh, yeah. Cranial nerve five has three nuclei. <laughs> I'll do that. I actually did that once in a lecture. I'll unlock that video. I have uploaded it. You guys can watch it if you have the time. Uh, cranial nerve five, which forms a ganglion called the, what is this cranial nerve's name? Trigeminal. Yes, trigeminal. What are the three branches of the trigeminal? Ophthalmic, yes. mandibular, mandible. Yes, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, which of these have a motor innovation? There's only one of these nerves which have a motor innovation. Which of these three? Mandibular. Mandible. Yes. It innovates the muscles of uh, mastication. Okay. Uh, so guys, trigeminal nerve is involved in, it's a huge headache. Just remember it like that because the ophthalmic div division innovates this region. The maxillary region is this. Then the mandibular region is this. And why is this important? It carries sensory fibers. Okay? So any pain, temperature, whatever headaches you get, it is from, if it is from the facial region, it goes through the trigeminal nerve. Okay? And the mandibular nerve is the only one that has a motor function. I hope you guys understand that. Next, I will talk about the nerves that come out of the bulbopontine sulcus. This was asked in an MCQ. So basically, it's six, seven, eight. Cranial nerve six, seven, eight. Okay. Can someone tell me uh, what is cranial nerve six? Abduction. Yes. Nice. What is seven? Facial. Can you tell me the function of the facial nerve? Now the trigeminal is sensory. Facial nerve? Mixed. Expression. It's a mixed nerve. It's a mixed nerve, but it's mainly, its main function is motor. motor. All your smiling, all your facial expressions, it's done by the facial nerve. Okay? Cranial nerve weight. Vestibular cochlea. Yes. The way I remember it is 
your ears are on the other side of the saying. It carries vestibular nerves and cochlear nerves, that is balance and hearing, okay? Now, this is the anterior aspect of the brain. I'll do the posterior aspect of the brain. Okay, let me add one page. Okay, we are almost done. Uh, okay. Uh, this is the posterior aspect of the brainstem. Cuneate gracilis tubercles, cuneate C G. Sorry, C G G C. Cuneate tubercle. Gracil gracili. Tubercle. And then we have the pons. And we have two structures. Do you know the names of these out pouches, the structures that come out? Like if you look from behind at the midbrain, you will see two structures like this. Well, sorry. So if you are to look at the midbrain, it is going to look like this. This region is the midbrain, pons, and this is the medulla oblongata. What are these two structures? It's called the superior colliculus. Superior colliculus. Yes. And inferior colliculus. Yes, nice. One is for vision, the other one is for hearing, which is for vision. Superior. Yes, it's for vision, while the inferior is for hearing. Okay. And this fact, memorize this. I don't know, whatever you can do. Remember this below the inferior colliculus, cranial nerve four comes out. And it comes out and moves forward. Okay. Cranial nerve four is the only nerve which originates from the back of the um, brainstem. It comes from back, moves forward. Okay. What is this nerve called? Trochlea. Trochlea. Nice. So, uh, okay, for me, over time, I remember the nerves because I kept using it. And uh, that's what I feel like uh, the person who answered. I don't know who answered, but that's really good. There's actually a mnemonic device I'll send you guys after the class. So the more you use, the more you know which nerve is which. Next, I'm going to show you guys the fourth ventricles. This is the fourth ventricle. Okay. And so this is the third ventricle. This is the cerebral aqueduct. And this rhomboid shaped structure is the fourth ventricle. Okay. Now, if you were to stand inside this, let's take a Situation where you are standing inside the fourth ventricle and you look up. Can you guys tell me what will you see? If you were to look up, we are looking at the posterior aspect of the brain. So if you are looking up from here, what would you see? Superior padding. No, uh, it's like in between. Uh, actually, I drift this. It should be more below. It doesn't go to the midbrain. It doesn't go to the midbrain. It's in the pons. And the it's like between these two sulci, somewhere here. Sorry, guys, that was my bird. 
it's there's a structure called the cerebellum so if you are to stand inside the fourth ventricle and look up you will see the cerebellum okay and the cerebellum has three foot processes now this is called the cerebral peduncle the cerebellum has three foot processes it's called the superior middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles okay what it basically means it's it's like a foot process which holds the cerebellum okay this if you guys can uh, understand all of this you will understand everything to do with the structures that you will find in the ppt yeah oh yeah there's one more thing the superior cerebellar peduncle has a structure which connects to each other from one cerebellar peduncle to the other it's called superior medullary velum okay i know it's messy but this is very important and uh, give me 5 minutes guys i will finish the thalamus and uh, the reticular formation i need to do that that's like let me do those topics and we are done okay now here is the fourth ventricle guys draw this with me we are drawing the fourth ventricle right now and here is the cerebral aqueduct and here we have the third ventricle guys <clears throat> okay just understand this because uh it's very important okay you guys can see this right so on top of this between the two third ventricle is where you find the thalamus there's two thalami which you find like this draw the y shape facing forward okay you find the two thalami like this on top of the cerebral peduncle and there is something called the medial and the lateral lateral geniculate body lateral geniculate body and from there you have this optic tracts which ends in the optic chiasma optic tracts which joins together at this optic chiasma optic chiasma and this is where you get the eyeball basically okay does anyone know what is the structure which fills this area does anyone know what is the structure that fills this area between the uh, third ventricle between the uh, optic tract what is the structure which fills this area called if there's a thalamus there has to be a it's called the hypothalamus guys okay and the hypothalamus it's going to fill this entire region over here there's two out pouches it's like two mammary glands like two breasts which are coming down which are called mammillary bodies okay these are called the mammillary bodies and we have
what is the structure called anyone yes this is the tubercle and just below this is something called the cella trishika nice okay and around this pituitary is where you get the circle of willis okay i hope you guys understand this and from the third ventricle you get the second ventricle the second ventricle is a bit complicated to draw just know that the third ventricle gives rise to the uh, second ventricles the lateral ventricles okay if you guys can understand this you guys are golden for neuro anatomy there's there's nothing to memorize you don't have to look at the ppt you have nothing to memorize and the final thing i want to talk about the rest reticular formation okay now the reticular formation originates from the spinal cord comes all the way through the brain stem and it basically supplies the whole brain let me basically supplies the whole brain with its fibers okay this is the reticular formation and this was the hardest topic for me when i studied uh, anatomy in the second year so but this thing is it starts from the spinal cord what happens is at certain places the gray matter i will use gray will mix with the white matter okay the gray matter will mix with the white matter to form these these bundles of fibers it contains both gray matter i axons plus cell uh, cell bodies okay and these will go up and this is literally the reason why you are awake and aware so what happens is it's like a set of christmas lights it keeps your brain active it keeps sending signals to, to keep your brain active so throughout the day the neurotransmitters are going to be depleting like throughout the day your neurotransmitter levels will decrease so that's why in the evening you feel tired and you need to rest because when you rest the neurotransmitters will regenerate again okay so that it's ready for the next day do you guys understand this let's this is the reason why you remain awake and aware if there is damage to this it can lead to a coma okay first thing if there is damage to the region of the medulla the reticular formation has the centers that control the cardiovascular system the respiratory system and the gi system basically the vomiting system uh etc if this reticular formation is damaged the person can die if the uh, of the medulla region okay of any other region they can go into a coma okay and also these are involved in simple they send fibers for simple somatic motor activities okay and emotional responses also there is a postulate that if this gets overactivated in the sense these neurons get overactivated if this 
there's going to be overactivation of the brain and these neurons, it can lead to epilepsy. You know, seizures fits. So basically, it's a two-way thing. If it is underactivated, it can lead to a coma. If it is overactivated, it can lead to a seizure. Okay, think of suddenly lighting up this whole thing in strobes, something like that. And also, it some other functions, let for just for completion's sake, other functions. There's the endocrine, the biorhythm, learning, memory, etc. Okay. So uh, guys, give me one more minute. I will do the internal capsule also, then we are done. Like I won't be doing another class for central nervous system after this. I have covered everything. And for the hypothalamus, you guys can watch a video that I have made and I will send you guys. Uh, let's take the limbic system, the basal ganglia and internal capsule. all at once, okay? Is it stuck? Okay, let's take all of these at once. Here's the thalamus. Can someone tell me what goes in the middle of the thalamus? What is flowing in the middle of the thalamus? Basal artery. No, what is the structure? Basal sulcus. No, no, no. Uh, this is the third ventricle. So here we have a structure called the pineal gland. Pineal gland. Okay. Does anyone know what the pineal gland releases? Melatonin. Yes. So at this point, there's something called the pineal gland, which releases melatonin. It brings changes at the right age, okay? It brings puberty at the correct age, stuff like that. Next, adjacent to this thalamus, you have the internal capsule, okay? And the internal capsule, it has three parts. is the anterior, posterior, and I actually forgot the middle one. I'm, uh, let me check the middle one. Give me a second. Okay, I'll check it and send. So the anterior one has the fronto pontine tract and the anterior thalamic tract. I think this is called the genome. Let me check. I will check this. This is. G E N U. Uh, this is the corticonuclear tract. And the posterior tract has a corticospinal tract. Posterior. So then the central thalamic radiation, optic radiation, and acoustic radiation. These are the tracks which are present in uh, the internal capsule. Okay, these three regions, you need to know the tracts, you need to know the corticospinal tract is in the posterior and you need to know optic radiation and the acoustic radiation tracts go in the posterior. Okay, what these are is basically the brain is going to send its fibers down through this thick bundle of white matter. The internal capsule is nothing except a bundle of white matter. Okay, 
It's just a thick bundle of white matter that goes down. Okay. And then we have a nucleus that looks like a lens. It's called the lentiform nucleus. Okay, this is called the lentiform nucleus. So same thing on the other side. And uh, this is called the putamen. And the internal one is called the globus pallidus. Okay. Right now, I'm drawing structures of the basal ganglia. So the thalamus is a part of the basal ganglia. This lentiform nucleus is a part of the basal ganglia. Okay. And uh, there's one more structure which is present on the midbrain. Which is called the substantia nigra, which produces dopamine. which is also a part of this midbrain uh, of the basal ganglia. Okay. So uh, this is the part of the basal ganglia. I hope you guys understood this. There's one more structure of the basal ganglia, which I need to draw. There is this large nucleus, which starts from the bottom and has something like a bell comes up from here above the thalamus and ends like this. Sorry guys, I had to draw it over the writings. This is called the chordate nucleus. Okay. And this structure is called the amygdala. Now the amygdala I will just draw the amygdala now. It is a part of the limbic system. So what I did was on the on this side, I drew the basal ganglia. And on this side, I will draw the uh, limbic system. Okay. So there's the amygdala. And there's going to be the hippocampus, which connects to that. This is the hippocampus, which is attached to this amygdala, and it goes all the way in a structure. This structure is called the phonix. This is called the phonix. It goes above, guys. It goes from above to the mammillary bodies. Okay. And uh, do you guys remember the lenticular striate nucleus, which I uh, talked about in uh, the circle of Willis? It innovates the internal capsule. Lenticulo, striate, artery. This innovates the internal capsule. And if there is a stroke, if there's a stroke, it leads to something called the contralateral triad syndrome. Okay. Guys, I'm going to show you everything uh, that I'm doing right now in the PPT. It's everything is there in the uh, PowerPoint. So I understand the importance of these hemiplegia. Does anyone know what hemiplegia is? Paralysis of half of the body. Yes, paralysis of half of the body. So it is due to damage to the corticospinal tract or the corticonuclear tract. Why didn't I add the corticonuclear tract? Oh yeah, here, the corticonuclear tract and the corticospinal tract. The other one is hemianopia. 
this is a visual disturbance due to damage to the optic radiation. And this is hemi anesthesia. Can someone tell me what is hemi anesthesia? What does uh, anesthesia do? Anesthetic. Loss of sensation. Yeah, basically no, it uh, numbs you. So the patient will have contralateral. If the damage is on this side, he will manifest the symptoms on the other side. And the symptoms will be a triad. That is these three symptoms will occur together at the same time. Okay, you will get these three symptoms happening at the same time. So uh, I will add the final points for the basal ganglia and will be done. So the chordate plus putamen it's called the neo striatum. Just know this. Neo, does anyone know the meaning of neo? If you can, uh, if you guys can uh, understand these, the difference between these two, you can under understand the time period these names came out. New layer, old layer. Exactly. And uh, that is also very important when you come to the topic cerebellum. Okay. I won't do this part, but check the uh, MCQs that I put in the Telegram group. You have a question which is asking about the neo cerebellum. Okay. And okay, let me tell you the answer to that. So the cerebellum, this is the vermis. The medial part, the medial part of the cerebellum and the lateral part. Okay, this is the new cerebellum. And there's another structure called a flocculus. So uh, let me quickly tell you guys this part. Yeah, uh, guys, I'm sorry. Like I need to refer before I tell anything I have in that part. Uh, I need you guys to know one thing. There is a nucleus called dentate nucleus, which is present in the cerebellum. Okay. It is involved in coordination. So dentate means it looks like teeth. Okay. That's it for today. If you have any questions, if you have any doubts, send me a message, I'll reply. And um, before I end this, I will show you guys the PPT so that you know, uh, you understand the importance of what I did. Look at these funiculars, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, the, the enlargements, then the, Phylum terminale, it's a fibrous extension. Fissures, sulci. Okay, these are, this part was done. Remember, it's an increase of 444 and 333. Uh, sorry. And uh, then the anterior horn, posterior horn, having the sensory neurons, motor neurons. I didn't talk about the lateral horn, but basically, uh, in the side of the gray matter, you have the lateral horn that has the sympathetic motor neurons. Then the fasciculi, I talked about this and it's very important. These are basically, guys, I'm not sharing the, am I sharing the PowerPoint? Yes, okay. you're sharing the PowerPoint. Okay. 
So uh, here are the, the spinocerebellar tracts. I didn't do that because uh, like I felt it might be a bit too much. You guys, it's not hard. Uh, if you go, if don't understand the send me a message, I'll explain it. And here are the extra pyramidal tracts. Tectospinal, reticulospinal, rubrospinal. The rubrospinal tract ends in something called, okay, it goes to something called the red nucleus, which is found in the midbrain. Are those who have heard of the red nucleus? See, I didn't do these. So the medulla oblongata, all these things I did. This cranial nerve nucleus and the rhomboid fossa, I did the cranial nerve nuclei. I did it in a previous lecture. I will send the link to that video. Uh, all of these nucleus I did there. Spinothalamic lemonisci, pyramidal tract, corticonucleus, reticular formation of the brain. See, uh, ascending tract, deep coma. Uh, then the visceral motor control tract. You guys have to go through this. You will understand what was taught. See, uh, okay. Uh, no, I didn't. Here are the cerebellum structures. Vermis, cerebellar hemispheres, flocular, nodular lobes. Here are the three names. Cerebro cerebellum, lateral part of the hemisphere. I just drew and showed that. Then the spinocerebellum, it's the middle part of the cerebellum and the uh, vermis. And the archi, you need to know these names. All of these names you need to know, okay? Neo means neo. Cerebellum, the dentate nucleus. Ah, okay. Pastichial and interposed. So, uh, guys, I will do another lecture maybe tomorrow because uh, I know you can't watch those cerebellar lecture videos which are like really long. But basically, uh, the language part also, I did the basic introduction so you guys can uh, easily understand what is needed. Basal nucleus, I did all of these. Amygdaloid bodies. See, uh, wait, what's this? You can see amygdaloid body belongs to the limbic system. Parkinson's disease, it's a disease of the basal nucleus. White matter. Internal capsule. Anterior limb, Gino. I was correct, I assume. Right? Yeah, I was correct. It's the Gino and the posterior limb. Lenticular striate nucleus, the contralateral triad syndrome. This is anatomy. Okay, so understand the importance of what was done and try to understand, not memorize stuff. Visual pathways, I did these. Pain, crude temperature, touch. I did these. You just have a little to add and look at this. I cannot highlight how important this is the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron, okay? Everything goes up in the upper motor neuron, everything goes down in the lower motor neuron, okay? And uh, this pathologic reflex is what, uh, you can see the Babinski sign. What is considered the Babinski sign here? They will directly ask it as Babinski sign. Then the meninges, dura pia, foramen magnum, spinal nerves, Epidural anesthesia, I did all of these. Spinal arachnoid, subarachnoid, L3, L4, L5. Lumbar puncture, spinal pia matter, denticulate ligaments, cerebral dura matter. Oh, I didn't do this. I will do this tomorrow or something. This thing can confuse a lot of students, it's very easy, but it can easily confuse people. And I didn't do this. I will do those tomorrow. Choroid plexus, vertebral arteries, basilar arteries, 
internal carotid arteries, anterior cerebral. It's here, lesion, if something happens, it's called hydrocephalus. Okay, blood brain barrier, this is uh, physiology. Uh, Yeah, so that's it. If you guys understood it, uh, if you guys have any questions, send me a message. I will explain everything. Okay. Uh, this is, yeah, anatomy. 